just useful for developing new ideas, it is invaluable for navigating struggle. When people come to work with a higher sense of purpose, they find it easier to weather hard times or even to find opportunity in those hard times. People who come to work with a clear sense of why are less prone to giving up after a few failures because they understand the higher cause. Thomas Edison, a man definitely driven by a higher cause, said, I didn't find a way to make a light bulb, I found a thousand ways how not to make one. Southwest Airlines is famous for pioneering the 10-minute turnaround, the ability to deplane, prep, and board a plane in 10 minutes. This ability helps an airline make more money, because the more the planes are in the sky, the better the company is doing. What few people realize is that this innovation was born out of struggle. In 1971, Southwest was running low on cash and needed to sell one of their aircraft to stay in business. This left them with three planes to fly a schedule that required four. They had two choices, they could scale back their operations, or they could figure out how to turn their planes around in 10 minutes. And thus was born the 10-minute turnaround. Whereas most other airline employees would have simply said it couldn't be done, Southwest's people rallied to figure out how to perform the unprecedented and seemingly impossible task. Today, their innovation is still paying dividends. Because of increased airport congestion and larger planes and cargo loads, Southwest now takes about 25 minutes to turn their planes around. However, if they were to try to keep the same schedule but add even 5 minutes to the turnaround time, they would need an additional 18 planes in their fleet at a cost of nearly a billion dollars. Southwest's remarkable ability to solve problems, Apple's remarkable knack for innovation and the Wright brothers' ability to develop a technology with the team they had were all possible for the same reason, they believed they could and they trusted their people to do it. The definition of trust founded by Sir Francis Baring in 1762, Baring's bank was the oldest merchant bank in England. The bank, which survived the Napoleonic Wars, World War I and World War II, was unable to survive the predilection for risk of one self-proclaimed rogue trader. Nick Leeson single-handedly brought down Baring's Bank in 1995 by performing some unauthorized, extremely high-risk trades. Had the proverbial winds continued to blow in the right direction, Leeson would have made himself and the bank extremely rich and he would have been hailed as a hero. But such is the nature of unpredictable things like the weather and financial markets. Few dispute that what Leeson was doing was anything more than gambling. And gambling is very different from calculated risk. Calculated risk accepts that there can be great loses, but steps are taken to either guard against or respond to an unlikely but possible outcome. Even though an emergency landing on water is unlikely, as the airlines tell us, they still provide us life jackets. And if only for peace of mind, we're glad they do. To do otherwise is a gamble few airlines would be willing to take, even though the actuarial tables are heavily weighted on their side. Leeson strangely held two positions at bearings, ostensibly serving as both a trader and his own supervisor, but that fact is not interesting given the subject matter. That one man had such a tolerance for risk that he could create so much damage is not very interesting either. Both of those are short-term factors. Both would have ended if Leeson had either left the company or changed jobs, or if Bearings had assigned a new supervisor to oversee his operations. What is more interesting is the culture at the bank that could allow these conditions to exist in the first place. Bearings had lost its why. The culture at Bearings was no longer one in which people came to work inspired, one motivated, yes, but not inspired manipulated by the promise of massive payouts for performance, for sure, but not inspired to work in the best interest of the whole. As Leeson reported in his own account of how he got away with such risky behavior for so long, he said it was not that others didn't recognize that what he was doing was potentially dangerous. It was worse than that. There was a stigma against speaking out. People at the London end of Bearings, Leeson explained, were all so null that nobody dared ask a stupid question in case they looked silly in front of everyone else. 
the lack of a clear set of values and beliefs, along with the weak culture that resulted, created the conditions for an every man for himself environment, the long term impact of which could yield little else than disaster. This is caveman stuff. If the people aren't looking out for the community, then the benefits of the community erode. Many companies have star employees and star salesmen and so on, but few have a culture that produces great people as a rule and not an exception. Trust is a remarkable thing. Trust allows us to rely on others. We rely on those we trust for advice to help us make decisions. Trust is the bedrock for the advancement of our own lives, our families, our companies, our societies and our species. We trust those in our community to care for our children so we can go out to dinner. Given the choice between two babysitters, we're more likely to trust a babysitter with a little experience from the neighborhood than one with lots of experience from far away. We wouldn't trust someone from the outside because we don't know anything about them, we say. The reality is, we don't know anything about the local babysitter either, beyond the fact that she's from the neighborhood. In this case, we trust familiarity over experience with something quite important, the safety of our children. We trust that someone who lives in the community and more likely shares our values and beliefs is better qualified to care for the most valuable thing in our lives over someone with a long resume but from an unfamiliar place. That's pretty remarkable. It causes some pause when we consider how we hire people, what's more important, their resume and experience or whether they will fit our community. Our children are probably more important than the position we want to fill at the organization, yet we seem to exercise a very different standard. Is there a false assumption at play here as to who makes the best employee? Historically, trust has played a bigger role in advancing companies and societies than skill set alone. Like the couple leaving their children while they go out on a date for the evening, Groups from within a society would go off with confidence, knowing that their homes and families would be safe upon their return. If there were no trust, then no one would take risks. No risks would mean no exploration, no experimentation and no advancement of the society as a whole. That's a remarkable concept, only when individuals can trust the culture or organization will they take personal risks in order to advance that culture or organization as a whole. For no other reason than, in the end, it's good for their own personal health and survival. No matter how experienced, no matter how proficient, a trapeze artist will not attempt a totally new death-defying leap without first trying it with a net below him. And depending on how death-defying the trick is, he may insist on always having a net when performing the trick. Besides its obvious advantage of catching you if you fall. The net also provides a psychological benefit. Knowing it is there gives the trapeze artist the confidence to try something he's never done before, or to do it again and again. Remove the nets and he will only do the safe tricks, the ones he knows he can't land. The more he trusts the quality of the net, the more he will take personal risks to make his act better. The trust the circus management gives him by providing him a net is probably afforded to other performers too. Soon all the performers will feel confident to try new things and push themselves further. That collection of personal confidence and personal risk results in the entire circus putting on a much better show. An overall better show means more customers. And the system thrives. But not without trust. For those within a community, or an organization, they must trust that their leaders provide a net, practical or emotional. With that feeling of support, those in the organization are more likely to put in extra effort that ultimately benefits the group as a whole. I will admit that there are always those who will take the risk, for the first time or repeatedly, without the net. There will always be those who will explore regardless of who is home holding down the fort. These people sometimes earn their rightful spots as the innovators. The ones who pushed further, the ones who did things no one else would do. Some of them may advance a business or even society. And some of them end up dead before they achieve anything. There is bigger difference between jumping out of a plane with a parachute on and jumping without one. 
Both produce extraordinary experiences, but only one increases the likelihood of being able to try again another time. A trapeze artist with a personality predisposed to taking extraordinary risks without a net may be the star attraction in an otherwise mediocre show. But if he dies or leaves for another circus, then what? This is the paradigm in which someone is motivated by self-gain regardless of the consequences or the benefits to the organization for which he or she works. In such a case, the effort may be good for the individual and it may be good for the group, but the benefits, especially for the group, come with a time limit. Over time, this system will break down, often to the detriment of the organization. Developing trust to encourage people other than those with a predilection for risk, like Nick Leeson, is a better long-term strategy. Great organizations become great because the people inside the organization feel protected. The strong sense of culture creates a sense of belonging and acts like a net. People come to work knowing that their bosses, colleagues and the organization as a whole will look out for them. This results in reciprocal behavior. Individual decisions, efforts and behaviors that support, benefit and protect the long-term interest of the organization as a whole. Southwest Airlines, a company renowned for its customer focus, does not, as a matter of policy, believe the customer is always right. Southwest will not tolerate customers who abuse their staff. They would rather those customers fly on a different airline. It's a subtle irony that one of the best customer service companies in the country focuses on its employees before its customers. The trust between the management and the employees, not dogma, is what produces the great customer service. It is a prerequisite, then, for someone to trust the culture in which they work to share the values and beliefs of that culture. Without it, that employee, for example, is simply a bad fit and likely to work only for self-gain without consideration for the greater good. But if those inside the organization are a good fit, the opportunity to go the extra mile, to explore, to invent, to innovate, to advance and, more importantly, to do so again and again and again, increases dramatically. Only with mutual trust can an organization become great. Real trust comes from the things you can't see Rambo too, said the voice over Brigadier General Jumper's radio, referring to him by his call sign. Your group 180, 25 miles, closing fast. Barnyard radar contact, replied Rambo too, reporting that he had picked up the enemy group on his own radar. He had picked a one-star general. John Jumper was an experienced F-15 pilot with thousands of hours of flight time and over a thousand combat hours. By all measures, he was one of the best. Born in Paris, Texas, he had enjoyed a distinguished career. He'd flown just about everything the U.S. Air Force had, from cargo planes to fighter jets. Decorated and distinguished, the commander of his own combat wing, he was the embodiment of what it meant to be a fighter pilot smart and confident. But on that day, Jumper's reaction didn't match the situation he faced. By 25 miles, he would have been expected to fire his weapons or take some other offensive movement. Fearing that Jumper was locked onto the wrong contact on his radar, Captain Laurie Robinson calmly repeated what she could see from miles away, Rambo 2 confirm radar contact your group now 190-20 miles. As the air weapons controller who was watching the action on her radar screen from a nearby command and control center, it was Laurie Robinson's job to direct the pilot toward enemy aircraft so that he could use his weapons to intercept and destroy them. Unlike an air traffic controller, whose job it is to keep air traffic apart, the weapons controller has to bring the planes closer together. From the vantage point of the radar screen, only the weapons controller has the big picture as the pilot's onboard navigation system shows only what's directly in front of the aircraft. Captain Robinson saw her job as something bigger, however, than just staring at radar, something more profound than just being the eyes and ears for the pilots who were hurtling into harm's way at 1,500 miles per hour. Captain Robinson knew why her job was important. She saw herself as responsible for clearing a path for the pilots in her care so that they could do what they needed to do, 
aircraft so they could push themselves and their aircraft further with greater confidence. And for this reason, she was unusually good at her job. Robinson couldn't make mistakes. If she did, she would lose the trust of her pilots and, worse, they would lose trust in themselves. You see, it's confidence that makes fighter pilots so good at their jobs. And then it happened. Captain Robinson could tell from the calm of Jumper's voice over the radio that he was unaware of the threat coming at him. On a cloudless day, 20,000 feet over the desert, the alarm screeched in Rambo II's $25 million, state-of-the-art fighter jet. He looked up from his radar screen and saw the enemy engaging him. Break right. Break right. He screamed into his radio. On October 9, 1988, Brigadier General John R. Jumper was killed. Captain Robinson waited. There was an eerie calm. Before too long, Jumper stormed into the debriefing room at Nellis Air Force Base. You got me killed. He barked at Captain Robinson. Situated in the Nevada desert, Nellis is home to the Air Force Fighter Weapons School, and on that day, General John Jumper took a direct hit from a simulated missile from another U.S. Air Force jet playing the part of an enemy combatant. Sir, it was not my fault, Captain Robinson replied calmly. Check the video. You'll see. General Jumper, then the 57th Wing Commander, a graduate of the USAF Fighter Weapons School, and a former instructor at Nellis, routinely evaluated every detail of every training mission he flew. Pilots often relied on the video to learn from their exercises. The video didn't lie. And it didn't on that day either. It revealed that the error was indeed his, not Captain Robinson's. It was a classic blunder. He had forgotten he was part of a team. He had forgotten that what made him so good at his job was not just his ability. Jumper was one of the best because there were others who were looking out for him. A massive infrastructure of people he couldn't see. Without question General Jumper had been given the best equipment, the best technology and the best training that money could buy. But it was the mechanics, the teachers, his fellow pilots, the culture of the Air Force and Captain Robinson who ensured that he could trust himself to get the job done. General Jumper forgot why he was so good and made a split-second decision that cost him his life. But this is what training is for, to learn these lessons. Some 16 years after his lesson over the Nevada desert, General Jumper went on to big things. Now a retired four-star general, he served as chief of staff of the U.S. Air Force from 2001 to 2005, the highest-ranking uniformed office in the entire Air Force, responsible for the organization, training and equipping of nearly 700,000 active duty, guard, reserve and civilian forces serving in the United States and overseas. As a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he, along with the other service chiefs, advised the Secretary of Defense, the National Security Council and the President. This is not, however, a story about General Jumper. It is a story about Laurie Robinson. Now herself a Brigadier General in the Air Force, she no longer has her face down a scope. There are no more buggies and bandits, the Air Force's nicknames for the good guys and the bad guys, in her life. Even though her job has changed, General Robinson still starts every day by reminding herself why she came to work, day by rem as much as she misses her kids, as she called those who served under her command, General Robinson is still looking for ways she can clear a path for others so that they can push themselves and the organization further. The time to think of yourself is done, it is not about you, it is about the lieutenants behind you, she'd remind her students when she was an instructor at the fighter weapons school. If enough of us do this, she goes on, referring to why she does what she does, then we leave this military and this country in better shape than we found it. And isn't that the point? And it is that sense of purpose, a clear idea of why she comes to work, that has been the cornerstone of General Robinson's success. And that, incidentally, has been remarkable. Working hard to clear a path for others so that they can confidently go on to do bigger and better things has in turn inspired others to clear a path for General Robinson to do exactly the same thing.
As a woman in the very masculine world of the military, she sets an example for how to lead. Great leadership is not about flexing and intimidation, great leaders, as General Robinson proves, lead with why. They embody a sense of purpose that inspires those around them. General Robinson was so trusted as a weapons controller that it was not unusual for pilots in training to request that she be assigned to them. The greatest compliment I ever got was when people would say, when I go to war, I want Laurie on the radio, she says. She is the first woman in the history of the Air Force to command the 552nd Air Control Wing out of Tinker Air Force Base, one of the largest wings in Air Combat Command, the wing that flies the AWACS airborne control aircraft, the fleet of Boeing 707s with the huge rotating radar dishes on top. She is the first commander of a combat wing ever who didn't come up through the pilot ranks. She was the first female weapons school instructor to teach at the Air Force Fighter Weapons School, where the Air Force trains all its top guns. There, she became the most celebrated teacher in the ranks, winning best teacher seven classes in a row. She is the first female director of the Secretary of the Air Force and Chief of Staff of the Air Force Executive Action Group. In 2000, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said of General Robinson, at the time still a captain, that she singularly influenced his ideas on air power. And the list goes on. By any measure, General Laurie Robinson is a remarkable leader. Some in management positions operate as if they are in a tree of monkeys. They make sure that everyone at the top of the tree looking down sees only smiles. But all too often, those at the bottom looking up see only asses. Great leaders like General Robinson are respected by those both above and below. Those in her command trust her implicitly because they know she's committed to looking after them. There's nothing you can do that I can't fix, she was often heard telling students at fighter weapons school. And those to whom she reports show remarkable deference to her. I don't know how she gets away with half the stuff she does, say those who know her. More importantly, it is said with a grin and with respect. General Robinson's ability to lead developed not because she's the smartest or the nicest. She's a great leader because she understands that earning the trust of an organization doesn't come from setting out to impress everyone, it comes from setting out to serve those who serve her. It is the invisible trust that gives a leader the following they need to get things done. And in Laurie Robinson's case, things get done. I use the military because it exaggerates the point. Trust matters. Trust comes from being a part of a culture or organization with a common set of values and beliefs. Trust is maintained when the values and beliefs are actively managed. If companies do not actively work to keep their golden circle in balance, clarity, discipline and consistency, then trust starts to break down. A company, indeed any organization, must work actively to remind everyone why the company exists. Why it was founded in the first place. What it believes. They need to hold everyone in the company accountable to the values and guiding principles. It's not enough to just write them on the wall, that's passive. Bonuses and incentives must revolve around them. The company must serve those whom they wish to serve it. With balance, those who are good fits can trust that everyone is on board for the same reasons. It's also the only way that each individual in the system can trust that others are acting to leave the organization in a better way than we found it, to quote General Robinson again. This is the root of passion. Passion comes from feeling like you are a part of something that you believe in, something bigger than yourself. If people do not trust that a company is organized to advance the why, then the passion is diluted. Without managed trust, people will show up to do their jobs and they will worry primarily about themselves. This is the root of office politics, people acting within the system for self-gain often at the expense of others, even the company. If the company doesn't manage trust, then those working for it will not trust the company, and self-interest becomes the overwhelming motivation. This may be good for the short term but over time the organization will get weaker and weaker. Herb Kelleher, the visionary behind Southwest Airlines, understood this better than most. 
he recognized that to get the best out his employees he needed to create an environment in which they felt like the company cared about them. He knew that they would naturally excel if they felt the work they did made a difference. When a journalist asked Kelleher who comes first to him, his shareholders or his employees, his response was heresy at the time, and to a large degree still is. Well, that's easy, he said, employees come first and if employees are treated right, they treat the outside world right, the outside world uses the company's product again, and that makes the shareholders happy. That really is the way that it works and it's not a conundrum at all. The influence of others whom do you trust more, someone you know or someone you don't know? What do you trust more, a claim made in a piece of advertising or a recommendation from a friend? Whom do you trust more, the waiter who tells you, everything on the menu is great, or the waiter who tells you to avoid the chicken casserole? Are these questions too easy? Then how about this one, why should anyone trust you? Personal recommendations go a long way. We trust the judgment of others. It's part of the fabric of strong cultures. But we don't trust the judgment of just anyone. We are more likely to trust those who share our values and beliefs. When we believe someone has our best interest in mind because it is in their benefit to do so, the whole group benefits. The advancements of societies were based a great deal on the trust between those with a common set of values and beliefs. The feeling of trust is lodged squarely in the same place as the why the limbic brain, and it's often powerful enough to trump empirical research, or at least see doubt. This is the reason why so many manipulations are effective, we believe that, for better or worse, others know more than we do. Clearly, four out of five dentists know more than us when choosing chewing gum, but what about the one holdout? What did he know that the others didn't? Of course we trust the celebrity endorsement. Those celebs are rich and can use any product they want. It must be good if they are putting their reputation on the line to promote it, right? You probably answered that question in your head already. Clearly they are endorsing the product because they are getting paid to. But if celebrity endorsements didn't work, companies wouldn't use them. Or perhaps it's the fear that they might work that fuels the million dollar wink and a smile that encourages us to choose one car over another or one lipstick over another. The fact is, none of us is immune to the effect of someone we know or feel like we trust influencing our decisions. Celebrity endorsements are used with this concept in mind. By using a recognizable face or name, so the assumption goes, people will more likely trust the claims being made. The flaw in this assumption is that celebrity status alone may work to influence behavior, but at this level it's just peer pressure. For it to work, the celebrity needs to represent some clear cause or belief. An athlete known for her work ethic may have some value to a company with the same belief, for example. Or an actor known for his charitable work would be a good fit for a company known for doing good. In these cases, it is clear that both the company and the celebrity are working together to advance the same cause. I recently saw an ad for TD Ameritrade that featured morning show hosts Regis Philbin and Kelly Reaper. I'm still trying to figure out the cause that two talk show hosts represent and how that matters when it comes to choosing one bank over another. When a company says that a celebrity represents the kind of qualities we want our customers to associate with us, they miss the point. The celebrity is another what to the company's why. The celebrity must embody the qualities that already exist at the company. Without clarity of why first, any benefit will amount to simply increasing recognition. So many decisions, and indeed contract negotiations, are based on an advertising industry measurement called a Q-score, a quotient of how well recognized a celebrity is, how famous they are, so to speak. The higher the score, the better the unaided awareness of the celebrity. This information alone is not enough. The clearer the spokesperson's own why is understood, the better ambassador they can be for a like-minded brand or company. But there is no measurement of a celebrity's why currently available, so the result is obvious. The value of too many celebrity endorsements is the celebrity appeal alone. 
unless the audience to which you are trying to appeal gets a sense of what that spokesperson believes, unless that spokesperson is one of us, the enforcement may drive recognition, it may even drive sales for the short term, but it will fail to build trust. A trusted recommendation is powerful enough to trump facts and figures and even multi-million dollar marketing budgets. Think of the young father who wants to do everything right for his newborn child. He decides he's going to get a new car, something safe, something to protect his child. He spends a week reading all the magazines and reports, he's seen all the advertising and decides that on Saturday he's buying a Volvo. The facts are in and his mind is made up. Friday night he and his wife head to a dinner party. Standing by the punch bowl is their friend the local car enthusiast. Our intrepid new father walks up to his friend and proudly announces that, as a new father, he's decided to buy a Volvo. Without a thought his friend replies, why would you do that? Mercedes is the safest car on the road. If you care about your kid, you'll get a Mercedes. Playing on his desires to be a good father, but also trusting his friend's opinion, one of three things will happen. Our young father will either change his mind and buy a Mercedes, he will go forward with his original decision, but not without some doubt about whether he's indeed doing the right thing, or he will go back to the drawing board to redo all his research in order to reassure himself of his decision. No matter how much rational information he has at his fingertips, unless that decision also feels right, stress will go up and confidence will go down. However you slice it, the opinions of others matter. And the opinions of those we trust matter most. The question isn't how should car companies talk to the father who bought the car. The question isn't even how they caught the highly influential opinion of his friend, the car guy. The concept of buyer and influencers isn't a new one. The question is, how do you get enough of the influencers to talk about you so that you can make the system tip? How are tipping point tips? If I told you I knew of a company that invented an amazing new technology that will change the way we consume TV, would that pique your interest? Perhaps you'd be interested in buying their product or investing in their company. It gets better. They have the single best product available. Their quality is through the roof, way better than anything else on the market. And their PR efforts have so been remarkable, they've even become a household name. Interested? This is the case of TiVo. A company that seemed to have everything going for them but turned out to be a commercial and financial failure. Since they seemed to have the recipe for success, TiVo's flop defied conventional wisdom. Their struggles, however, are easily understood if you consider that they thought what they did mattered more than why. They also ignored the law of diffusion of innovations. In 2000, Malcolm Gladwell created his own tipping point when he shared with us how tipping points happen in business and in society. In his aptly named book The Tipping Point, Gladwell identifies groups of necessary populations he calls connectors and influencers. With little doubt Gladwell's ideas are spot on. But it still begs the question, why should an influencer tell anyone about you? Marketers are always trying to influence the influencers, but few really know how. We can't dispute that tipping points happen and the conditions that Gladwell articulates are right, but can a tipping point happen intentionally? They can't just be an accidental phenomenon. If they exist, then we should be able to design one, and if we can design one, we should be able to design one that lasts beyond the initial tip. It's the difference between a fad and an idea that changes an industry or society forever. In his 1962 book Diffusion of Innovations, Everett M. Rogers was the first to formally describe how innovations spread through society. Thirty years later, in his book Crossing the Chasm, Jeffrey Moore expanded on Rogers' ideas to apply the principle to high-tech product marketing. But the law of diffusion of innovations explains much more than just the spread of innovation or technology. It explains the spread of ideas. If you don't know the law, you're likely already familiar with some of its terminology. Our population is broken into five segments that fall across a bell curve, innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority and laggards. 
As the law states, the first 2.5% of the population are the innovators, and the next 13.5% are early adopters. Innovators, Moore says, pursue new products or ideas aggressively and are intrigued by any fundamental advance, being first is a central part of their lives. As their name suggests, innovators are the small percentage of the population that challenges the rest of us to see and think of the world a little differently. Early adopters are similar to innovators in that they appreciate the advantages wrought by new ideas or technologies. They are early to recognize the value of new ideas and are quite willing to put up with imperfection because they can see the potential. Although quick to see the potential and willing to take risks to try new technologies or ideas, early adopters are not idea generators like the innovators. But both groups are similar, as Moore says, in that they rely heavily on their intuition. They trust their gut. Early adopters, like innovators but to a lesser degree, are willing to pay a premium or suffer some level of inconvenience to own a product or espouse an idea that feels right. Those on the left side of the diffusion curve are the ones who stood in line for six hours to be among the first to buy the iPhone. Apple's entry into the mobile phone market, even though they could have walked into a store a week later and bought one without waiting. Their willingness to suffer an inconvenience or pay a premium had less to do with how great the product was and more to do with their own sense of who they are. They wanted to be the first. These are also the personality types who bought flat screen TVs when they first came out even though they cost upwards of $40,000 and the technology was still far from perfect. My friend Nathan fits this profile. I walked around his house once and counted no fewer than 12 Bluetooth earpieces for his mobile phone lying around his house. I asked him why he had so many. Did they all break? I queried. No, he replied, they came out with a new one. There were also about five laptops, various models of Blackberry smartphones and boxes of other gadgets lying about that never quite worked that well. Nathan is an early adopter. The next 34% of the population are the early majority, followed by the late majority, and finally the laggards on the far right side of the spectrum. Laggards are the ones who buy touchtone phones only because they don't make rotary phones anymore. The early and late majority are more practical minded. For them, rational factors matter more. The early majority is slightly more comfortable with new ideas or technologies while the late majority is not. The farther right you go on the curve, the more you will encounter the clients and customers who may need what you have, but don't necessarily believe what you believe. As clients, they are the ones for whom, no matter how hard you work, it's never enough. Everything usually boils down to price with them. They are rarely loyal. They rarely give referrals and sometimes you may even wonder out loud why you still do business with them. They just don't get it, our gut tells us. The importance of identifying this group is so that you can avoid doing business with them. Why invest good money and energy to go after people who, at the end of the day, will do business with you anyway if you meet their practical requirements but will never be loyal if you don't. It's not too hard to recognize where people fall on the spectrum once you're in a relationship with them, the opportunity is to figure out which is which before you decide to work with them. We all sit at different places on this spectrum depending on the product or idea. Most of us are fiercely loyal to certain products and ideas at various times and demonstrate left side of the curve behavior. And for other products or ideas we exhibit right side of the curve behavior. When we sit on one side of the spectrum, we often have a hard time understanding those on the other side because their behavior doesn't make sense to us. My sister is an early adopter when it comes to fashion trends, whereas I'm firmly in the late majority. It was only recently that I finally caved and bought a pair of overpriced designer blue jeans. I admit they look good, but I still think they aren't worth the money and I can't understand why my sister thinks they are. In contrast, I'm an early adopter for some technologies. I bought a Blu-ray DVD player before they had perfected the technology. I paid about four or five times more for it compared to a regular DVD player. 
my sister can't understand why I waste my money on all that useless stuff, as she puts it. We will never see eye to eye on this stuff. Each of us assigns different values to different things and our behaviors follow accordingly. This is one of the major reasons why it is nearly impossible to convince someone of the value of your products or ideas based on rational arguments and tangible benefits. It's the old Ferrari and Honda Odyssey debate again. Designer Jean companies, or my sister, can talk to me until they are blue in the face about the importance of fabric quality, design and workmanship, it goes in one ear and out the other. Similarly, it can be proven, beyond a shadow of doubt, the rational benefits of choosing a $500 DVD player over a $100 one, my sister won't hear a word of it. And so the game of manipulation ensues. Again, although always effective, manipulations don't breed loyalty and they increase costs and stress for all parties involved. Most people or organizations that have something to sell, be it a product, service or idea, hope to achieve some level of mass market success or acceptance. Most hope to penetrate the bell of the curve. Getting there, however, is easier said than done. When you ask small businesses about their goals, many of them will tell you they want to be a billion dollar business in X number of years. The odds of that happening, unfortunately, don't look good. Of the 27 million businesses registered in the United States, fewer than 2,000 ever reach a billion dollars in annual revenues. And 99.9% .9 of all businesses in America have fewer than 500 employees. In other words, mass market success is really hard to achieve. Big companies have similar challenges repeating their mass market success. Just because they've done it once or twice doesn't mean they know how to do it every time. The Zoom, Microsoft's entry into the multi-gigabyte MP3 player market, for example, was pegged to take on the iPod. It didn't happen. Even if the quality is superior, there is more to succeeding than just the product and the marketing. Don't forget, the superior Betamax technology did not beat out the substandard VHS technology as the standard format for videotape in the 1980s. The best does not always win. Like any natural law, the law of diffusion must be considered if mass market acceptance is important to you. Refusal to do so will cost a lot of money and may result in a mediocre success, if not complete failure. There is an irony to mass market success, as it turns out. It's near impossible to achieve if you point your marketing and resources to the middle of the bell, if you attempt to woo those who represent the middle of the curve without first appealing to the early adopters. It can be done, but at massive expense. This is because the early majority, according to Rogers, will not try something until someone else has tried it first. The early majority, indeed the entire majority, need the recommendation of someone else who has already sampled the product or service. They need to know someone else has tested it. They need that trusted, personal recommendation. According to the law of diffusion, mass market success can only be achieved after you penetrate between 15% to 18% of the market. That's because the early majority won't try something new until someone else has tried it first. This is why we have to drop our price or offer value-added services. We're attempting to reduce the risk tolerance of these practical-minded people until they feel comfortable to buy. That's what a manipulation is. They may buy, but they won't be loyal. Don't forget, loyalty is when people are willing to suffer some inconvenience or pay a premium to do business with you. They may even turn down a better offer from someone else, something the late majority rarely does. The ability to get the system to tip is the point at which the growth of a business or the spreading of an idea starts to move at an extraordinary pace. It is also at this point that a product gains mass market acceptance. The point at which an idea becomes a movement. When that happens, the growth is not only exponential, it is automatic. It just goes. The goal of business then should not be to simply sell to anyone who wants what you have, the majority, but rather to find people who believe what you believe, the left side of the bell curve. 
they perceive greater value in what you do and will happily pay a premium or suffer some sort of inconvenience to be a part of your cause. They are the ones who, on their own volition, will tell others about you. That 15 to 18 percent is not made up of people who are simply willing to buy the product. It is the percentage of people who share your beliefs and want to incorporate your ideas, your products and your services into their own lives as what's to their own whys. They look to what you do as a tangible element that demonstrates their own purpose, cause or belief to the outside world. Their willingness to pay a premium or suffer inconvenience to use your product or service says more about them than it does about you and your products. Their ability to easily see why they need to incorporate your products into their lives makes this group the most loyal customers. They are also the most loyal shareholders and the most loyal employees. No matter where they sit in the spectrum, these are the people who not only love you but talk about you. Get enough of the people on the left side of the curve on your side and they encourage the rest to follow. I love asking businesses what their conversion is on new business efforts. Many answer proudly, 10%. Even if you ignore the principles of the golden circle, the law of averages says you can win about 10% of the business. Throw enough spaghetti against the wall and some of it sticks. To grow the business, all you need to do is more prospecting, which is why growing your business by aiming at the middle of the curve is so expensive. Though the business may grow, the average will stay about the same, and 10% is not enough for the system to tip. Likewise, 10% of your existing customers or clients will naturally show loyalty to you. But why are they so loyal? Like our inability to explain why we love our spouses, the best we can muster up to explain what makes them such great clients is, they just get it. And though this explanation may feel right, it is completely unactionable. How do you get more people to get it? This is what Moore refers to as the chasm, the transition between the early adopters and the early majority, and it's hard to cross. But not if you know why. If you have the discipline to focus on the early adopters, the majority will come along eventually. But it must start with why. Simply focusing on so-called influencers is not enough. The challenge is, which influencers? There are those who seem to fit the influencer profile more than others, but in reality we are all influencers at different times for different reasons. You don't just want any influencer, you want someone who believes what you believe. Only then will they talk about you without any prompts or incentives. If they truly believe in what you believe and if they are truly on the left side of the curve they won't need to be incentivized, they'll do it because they want to. The entire act of incentivizing an influencer is manipulative. It renders the influencer completely inauthentic to his or her group. It won't take long for the group to find out that a recommendation wasn't made with the group's best interest in mind, but rather because of one person's self-interest. Trust erodes and the value of the influencer is rendered useless. Refusing to consider the law of diffusion will cost you in 1997, TiVo was racing to market with a remarkable new device. Few would debate that from the time the product was introduced to the present day, TiVo has had the single highest quality product in its category. The company's PR has been extraordinary. They have achieved an unaided awareness that most brands can only dream of. They have become more than generic terms, like Kleenex, Band-Aids and Q-Tips. In fact, they have been able to achieve more than generic status, they are a verb in the English language, to TiVo. They were well funded with venture capital and had a technology that could truly reinvent how we consume television. The problem was, they marketed their technology directly to the middle of the bell curve. Seeing the mass market appeal of the product, they ignored the principles of the law of diffusion and targeted the masses. Compounding that bad aim, they attempted to appeal to the cynical majority by explaining what the product did instead of stating why the company or the product existed in the first place. They attempted to convince with features and benefits. They basically said to the mass market, we've got a new product. It pauses live TV. Skips commercials. Rewinds live TV. 
memorizes your viewing habits and records shows on your behalf without your needing to set it. Analysts were intrigued by the prospects of TiVo as well as its competitor, Replay, a well-funded startup backed by venture capital. One market researcher estimated that these so-called personal TV receivers would reach 760,000 subscribers by the end of the first year. TiVo finally shipped in 1999. Mike Ramsey and Jim Barton, two former colleagues who had founded TiVo, were certain the TV viewing public was ready. And they may have been if only TiVo knew how to talk to them. But despite the excitement among analysts and technophiles, sales were hugely disappointing. TiVo sold about 48,000 units the first year. Meanwhile, Replay, whose backers included the founders of Netscape, failed to gain a following and instead became embroiled in a dispute with the television networks over the way it allowed viewers to skip ads. In 2000, the company adopted a new strategy and a few months later was sold to Sonic Blue, which later filed for bankruptcy. Analysts were stumped as to why the TiVo machines weren't selling better. The company seemed to have everything going for it. After all, they had the recipe for success, a great quality product, money and ideal market conditions. In 2002, after TiVo had been on the market nearly three years, a headline in Advertising Age summed it up, Best, more US homes have outhouses than TiVos. At the time, there were 671,000 homes with outhouses in the United States compared with 504,000 to 514,000 homes with TiVo. Not only were sales poor, but the company has not fared well for its shareholders either. At the time of the initial public offering in the fall of 1999, TiVo stock traded at slightly over $40 per share. A few months later it hit its high at just over $50. The stock declined steadily for the rest of the year, and except for three short periods since 2001, it has never since traded over $10. If you apply the principles of the golden circle, the answer is clear, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, and TiVo attempted to convince consumers to buy by telling them only what the product did. Features and Rational Benefits the practical-minded, technophobic mass market's response was predictable. I don't understand it. I don't need it. I don't like it. You're scaring me. There were a small number of TiVo loyalists, probably about 10%, those who just got it, who didn't need an explicit articulation of why. They exist to this day, but there were not enough of them to create the tipping point that TiVo needed and predicted. What TiVo should have done is talked about what they believed. They should have talked about why the product was invented in the first place, and then ventured out to share their invention with the innovators and early adopters who believed what they believed. If they had started their sales pitch with why the product existed in the first place, the product itself would have become the proof of the higher cause, proof of why. If their golden circle was in balance, the outcome might have been quite different. Compare the original list of features and benefits with a revised version that starts with why, if you're the kind of person who likes to have total control of every aspect of your life, boy do we have a product for you. It pauses live TV. Skips commercials. Rewinds live TV. Memorizes your viewing habits and records shows on your behalf without you needing to set it, goes on your in this version, all the features and rational benefits serve as tangible proof of why the product exists in the first place, not the reasons to buy, per se. The why is the belief that drives the decision, and what it does provides us a way to rationalize the appeal of the product. Confirming their failure to tap the right segment of the market, TiVo offered a very rational explanation of what was happening. Until people get their hands on it, Rebecca Baer, a spokeswoman for TiVo, told the New York Times in 2000, they don't understand why they need this. If this line of logic was true, then no new technology would ever take hold. A fact that is patently untrue. Though MS Baer was correct about the mass market's failure to understand the value, 
It was TiVo's failure to properly communicate and rally the left side of the bell curve to educate and encourage the adoption that was the reason so few people got their hands on it. TiVo did not start with why. They ignored the left side of the curve and completely failed to find the tipping point. And for those reasons, people didn't get their hands on it, and the mass market didn't buy it. Fast forward almost a decade. TiVo continues to have the best digital video recording product on the market. Its unaided awareness continues to be through the roof. Nearly everyone knows now what the product is and what it does, yet the company's future is by no means secure. While millions of viewers may say they TiVo things all the time, unfortunately for TiVo, they aren't using a TiVo system. Rather, they TiVo shows using a digital video recorder provided by the cable or satellite company. Many try to make the argument that TiVo's failure was due to the cable company's superior distribution. But we know that people often go out of their way, pay a premium or suffer an inconvenience to buy a product that resonates on a visceral level with them. Until recently, people who wanted a custom Harley Davidson motorcycle waited upwards of six months to a year to take delivery of their product. By any standard, that's just bad service. Consumers could have just walked into a Kawasaki dealership and walked right out with a brand new bike. They could have found a very similar model with similar power and maybe even for less money. But they suffered the inconvenience willingly, not because they were in the market for a motorcycle, but because they wanted a Harley. TiVo is not the first to ignore these sound principles and won't be the last. The meager success of satellite radio technology like Sirius or XM Radio has followed a similar path. XM radio they offered a well-publicized, well-funded new technology that attempted to convince users with a promise of rational features and benefits, no commercials and more channels than the competition. Throw in an impressive array of celebrity endorsements, including rap star Snoop Dogg and 1970s pop icon David Bowie, and the technology still didn't stick. When you start with why, those who believe what you believe are drawn to you for very personal reasons. It is those who share your values and beliefs, not the quality of your products, that will cause the system to tip. Your role in the process is to be crystal clear about what purpose, cause or belief you exist to champion, and to show how your products and services help advance that cause. Absente why, new ideas and technologies quickly find themselves playing the price and feature game, a sure sign of an absence of why and a slide into commodity status. It is not the technology that failed, it was how the companies tried to sell it. Satellite radio has not displaced commercial radio in any meaningful way. Even when Sirius and XM merged, hoping the joint force of their companies would help change their luck, shares for the combined company sold for less than 50 cents apiece. And, last time I checked, XM was offering a discount, a promotion, free shipping and a claim of being America's number one satellite radio service with over 170 channels to push their product. Give the people something to believe in on August 28, 1963, 250,000 people from across the country descended on the mall in Washington, D.C., to hear Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. give his famous I Have a Dream speech. The organizers didn't send out 250,000 invitations and there was no website to check the date. How did they get a quarter of a million people to show up on the right day at the right time? During the early 1960s, the country was torn apart by racial tensions. There were riots in dozens of cities in 1963 alone. America was a country scarred by inequality and segregation. How the civil rights movement lifted an idea that all men are created equal to become a movement with the power to change a country is grounded in the principles of the Golden Circle and the law of diffusion. Dr. King was not the only person alive during that time.